First, I thought that was your boy sitting there, Brother Woods, <coughs> on the end there where the lady was riding, but it wasn't. When I opened my eyes, the angel of the Lord was hanging there. I thought it was David sitting there, but it isn't David, I don't think. You're not David Woods, are you? You sure look like a twin brother to him sitting right here. That's not David Woods. I just need something done. <laughs> Amen. Oh, how marvelous. The Lord's ways are fast finding out, aren't they? <laughs> Amen. If thou canst believe that all things are possible. <laughs> all right, we're going to open the word. I believe I'll just keep that to myself and let the Lord reveal it as he sees need. Over in the book of Numbers, the 20th chapter, now quickly, and we'll try to take about 20 minutes for the sermon, if the Lord willing, and now you be ready. I don't know what's going to happen now. The Lord Jesus just might do anything for us. Do you love him? Say amen. amen. Now the word amen means so be it. See, now we really love him. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak to the rock, and it shall bring forth its waters. And thou shalt bring forth water unto them, water out of the rock, and thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts water. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Now, I want to speak just a few moments on this great servant, Moses. You feel any better, sister, that is sitting there around? The little lady said, You feel a lot better now, don't you? You're healed, lady. Amen. A little heart trouble means you've been bothered with the kidney trouble. That's also when he had a very coy veins that have been bothering him. And isn't that right? That's right. Wave your hand. You were healed just then. Praise the Lord. I looked around at her and I seen her a while ago. She looked so dreary. And I happened to look back and I seen that angel stand there. I looked so much like David. You ought to meet Mr. Woods over here. He looked like his boy. Got to be a double. I looked back and I thought maybe that's David because I know David loves me and believes. And then I looked down and hanging with that little lady, and then I seen what her trouble was. All at once I looked back and she's just smiling. I thought, my little tell her, let her know it's over. So she said, Amen. And she was taken down by notes or something there. All right. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Amen. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it does. You can't you just can't beat him. He's just here to help us. Now the Lord said, We're told Moses to get the rod. Now, we want to speak on the rod and the rod pertaining to judgment. I just love to talk about Moses. He was a, a priest, king, and lawgiver, everything a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was. He was born in the world a fair child. In other words, he was born a prophet. They wasn't afraid of the king when they seen God. What kind of a... A thing happened when Moses was born. It does not record, but something happened when Moses was born. Because his parents seen it and know that they didn't care what the king said. They know their son was going to be faithful. They didn't fear it. So he was uh, pulled up out of the bulrushes and, and was raised right with just in every way. Went into the wilderness and led the children of Israel, a lawgiver and a priest and he was everything that Christ was in type. He was, and Christ was the antitype. Now, if we'll notice, Moses, uh, when he become the age of about 40, he refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter. Moses' life runs in a cycle of three cycles. First 40, next 80, then 120 when he died. Just a perfect, I could go through the scripture and show that of the dispensations of grace, of water, blood, and spirit, of justification, sanctification, of baptism, of the Holy Ghost, the first, second, and third coming of Christ, everything you want to type lays right smack in everything in the scripture. I'll roll right into them, them letters just like that. Now, in Moses, when he, the first 40 years, he was taught, who do you think Moses' teacher was? His mother. He couldn't have had any better because she was hired as a tutor to raise her own child. 
I tell you, God certainly pulled one over on Satan there, didn't he? He sure did. And Moses, knowing now from his mother that he was raised up her a spiritual woman, little is said about her, but brother, I want to be in glory when she receives her crown. Yes, sir, to see what takes place, how she taught that little fella right in the midst of the enemy, right there in the furnace of the heat of it, and told him that he would be the one that would deliver God's children out of that place. Moses, knowing that as a scholar, I guess I'll just go out and set the thing in order, he said. So he is 40 years old, so he thought, I'm getting old enough to do it. So he took the thing over in his own hand and failed. And every time that we take the matter in our hand, we're going to fail. You just go as the Lord leads. And what the Lord says do, then you do that and you'll never fail. You can't fail because you're following the leading of the Lord. If Moses had only waited just a little while and let things get ripe and let the thing get in the season, you can't plant corn and, and, and now and go out and get it in an hour. You've got to let it lay there and, and the uh, seed die and rot away and new life come up and spring in the corn. That's the way we do now. We're putting the seed in the hearts of the people that when this great time of reaping comes, see what I mean? It'll be... It'll be materialized and be a great thing happen. Now, Moses, after taking this situation in his own hand, found out that he was a total failure and run from the presence of Pharaoh and the presence of God and was a stranger for 40 years. Way back and he married an Ethiopian girl. And so uh, she had a lot of temper and Moses had a lot of temper. That was his trouble. I just imagine things wasn't so peaceful back there on the back of the desert at times. But God give it to him. Now, if you think you married a woman has a little temper, maybe God's kind of tame you down a little, you think. So, and vice versa. So, uh, Zipporah was uh, kind of a high-tempered. She proved it when she cut the foreskin from her son and threw it before Moses and said, Thou art a bloody husband to me. My! I'd imagine things wasn't too peaceful at times. But anyhow, back there, God was, what was he doing? Schooling into the boy's mind or the man's mind what the program of God was. Moses was uh, back there waiting. And now, uh, there he was. What did he do? He went to work for his father-in-law, Jethro, and he was herding his sheep out in the desert place. There is a perfect picture here before us tonight of a believer out of fellowship with God. There he was. No fellowship. Not one thing in that 40 years of spoke that God did for him or any way, any supernatural. He was out of fellowship. And when the church gets out of fellowship with God, miracles cease. Signs and wonders cease. Revivals cease. God just moves right out when he gets out of fellowship. The thing to do is keep that, what I was trying to say a while ago, the love of God in your heart. Keep fellowship with him, and he'll add these other things just as we mature. Don't you think so? And so Moses, out of fellowship, no fellowship, out there in a strange country amongst strangers, not his own people. She was his people. The people there were Ethiopians, and he was a Jew. And there, completely out of reach of God, seemingly, and God all the time knowing that no matter. How much of a mess that God, uh, man makes out of the program of God, God's going to straighten it out. Yeah. Right. So just know that there's going to be a church up here before God without spot, without blemish, without a wrinkle. God's going to do it. Now, if I fail to pe- preach the truth and Brother Joseph fails to preach the truth, and you brethren out there fail to preach the truth, God's able of these stones to write children unto Abraham. He's, somebody's going to preach and contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Somebody's going to pull the church on. That's right. So no matter how much the picture was marred, it taken God 40 years to rectify what Moses done in about three days. Just get that picture straightened out again. He just took Moses and set him out here and give him a high-tempered wife to kind of get him straightened out and... God went on down here uh, fixing a picture around again. So he got it straightened out, but he was determined that he was going to do it, and he ordained Moses to do so. Oh, I just love that. What, he's, what God has determined is going to happen. Oh, don't it give you a wonderful feeling? Yeah. 
What God has determined is has to be. That's right. He's going to do it anyhow. So what a time we can see here. It's God fixing his picture back. And one day, while Moses, out of fellowship with God, perhaps thought, well, the vision of ever delivering the children of Israel is all past and gone. I guess I'll live and die here in the desert, and that'll be all there is to it. Why was I ever born in the world, or perhaps walking around there? And he had a stick in his hand. And he was walking along, and God appeared in the form of a, an angel in a burning bush. And Moses seen, and I imagine he said, Now, way back out here where there's no more herders but myself, I wonder what that bush is on fire about. Has somebody slipped in here and set the bush afire? He watched it, and he watched it, and it didn't. God's got a way of attracting your attention some way, hasn't he? He got attention of a Jairus one day, or a little Jairus when he wouldn't believe in divine healing. He believed it, and he wanted Jairus' heart, so he just, only thing he could do is strike his daughter and let her die so that Jesus come over and raise her up again just, just to really get his attention, you see? God does that. Sometimes throws you on your back, sometimes sick, so he can make you look up. Yeah. That you realize. Like the old shepherd story that had a sheep that broke its leg, and he said, how'd the sheep break its leg? He said, I broke its leg. He said, why, well, you're a cruel shepherd to break your own sheep's leg? He said, no. He said, she wouldn't mind me. And said, so then I had to break her leg in order that I could pack her around and baby her a little bit and give her some special food so that she would love me and follow me. That's what God has to do sometimes. Kind of break us down once in a while to give us a little extra food, you know, to kind of love us a little bit. You know, that's exactly why I'm a gospel preacher tonight is because he come by a spell of sickness. When the doctor said I couldn't live, it's exactly right. It changed me, shut me. I hated the thoughts of a preacher. And one time while I had the Bantamweight Championship, the fellow said, say, I had a blue coat on, said, you look like one of these little box back Baptist preachers. And I said, look, fellow, you smile when you say that. <laughs> so I was right then ready to go fight with my partner. No preacher about me. And you see what God did? He had to lay me on the back when the doctor says it's all over. And then he come around and gave me a little special treatment. Tiny poured in the oil, you know, and said, I love you. I said, yes, Lord, I love you too. <laughs> so then we become friends. That's how Jesus does sometimes, has to pour in a little of balm of Gilead, you know, to kind of soothe things over to show you. He loves you, he heals you, and wants you to be well and love him and serve him and believe in him. Isn't he wonderful? Then that's the way he was doing Moses back there. And Moses stepped aside, attracted his attention, and he looked back over there and he thought, well, I, Moses, I guess you think now that I imagine the Lord seeing poor old Moses going crippling along there with this long white beard and hair. Well, years ago I had a vision and I thought the Lord would surely deliver the children of Israel, but God's done turned his back on me now. I'm back over here battling it out, so I guess I'll just have to stay this way. And I imagine God said, poor fella, I, I just had to do that to let you realize. But I'm going to show you now I'm with you. So he just attracted his attention over there. He wanted to get an audience with, with Moses. You know, God sometimes has to get you sick and in a hospital where the doctor says you ain't going to live to get an audience with you. Yeah. You call for it, don't you worry. Yeah. You just wait till the doctor says, oh, you say, I don't believe in divine healing. No such thing. That thing's nonsense. Let the doctor say all hopes is gone. God will get you an audience with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He has a way of doing things. He does yeah. it in his own way. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, it just makes me feel like being a real shopping Methodist. <laughs> no, they call it God. Does it? You see, he just does it in his own way. He just he's got a way of doing things, hasn't he? And I'm so glad that he has. Amen. So we see now that he, he got an audience with Moses but saying now this would be a very odd, odd sight. You know, God does things kinda of odd sometimes to get the audience. That's right. Somebody comes to me and he said, Hey, they say they got a holy roller down here to preach tonight. I believe I'll just go down and see what it's all about. The Milltown Baptist pastor. That's in my place at the Milltown Baptist Church tonight, William Hall. That fellow come over because he had put in the paper, said, Say, you ought to come here. This fellow preach. He's a little Billy Sunday. And here he come over. Oh, was he rank, his hair hanging down his face, and had one tooth out in a big corn cob pipe, and he wrapped it on the side of the church like that. When he knocked it out, walked in, said, Where is that little Billy Sunday? <laughs> Want to hear him. The deacon brother said, Now, sit down, Mr. Hall. He's a rough customer. And then he said, Maybe I better get up a little closer. I want to see what Billy Sunday looked like. He said, just making fun, you see. And that night he got saved. <laughs> and he's a pastor there in the same church tonight. See, God has a way of attracting you, doesn't he? 
just get you aside one time. So he said, now this will look a little strange to Moses, something out of the ordinary. So I'll just send this pillar of fire down there in that bush and let it, because it's going to lead him all through the wilderness anyhow. And so I'll just let it start burning, get Moses to come over here. So he attracted Moses' attention, so he draws over a little closer, you know, and said, well, that looks strange, that thing don't burn up. When he got close enough in speaking distance, oh, I want to get there, don't you? In speaking distance? Uh, uh. Just get the speaking distance, he said, Moses? He said, yes, Lord, here I am. <laughs> Take off your shoes now, you're on holy ground. So Moses unlatched his shoes and walked up a little closer and said, what is it, Lord? And he said, I have heard, I know, Moses, I can stand one word to you about what I've seen about you, but I've heard the groans of my people, and I have remembered my covenant with Abraham. Amen. His word, in other words. I remember what I promised Abraham. The same promise he gave Abraham, he's given to you, for you're the seed of Abraham. And he said, I remember my promise with Abraham, and I've come down to deliver my children. Take them back to the promised land. I'm sending you down. Moses said, oh, well, you see, I, I can't speak very well. He said, I'm not eloquent. He said, I, I can't speak good. He said, I'm a slow of speech. He said, I'm, I, I just can't do it. He said, uh, uh, well, uh, Aaron's on his road up and so forth. And so he said, what you got in your hand, Moses? He said, a stick. That's all he had, just an old stick. Picked it up out on the desert somewhere where he punched the, the sheep through the... Uh, gates or wherever he went, get him along. It's an old stick he cut out because he said it was a stick. He said, Moses, throw it down. And when he threw the stick down, it turned into a serpent. He t and Moses fled. And he said, pick it up. And he took it by the tail and it turned back to a stick again. Moses, I guess you say, I've seen strange sights today. <laughs> so when he seen that stick turn to a snake. Now, what was that stick? That's what we're going to speak on. What was that stick? It wasn't an ordinary stick anymore, for it was the judgment rod of Almighty God. What did it symbolize? The cross. And then, why did, how would it symbolize the cross? Because on the natural, it was wood. On the spiritual, it was a serpent. And how could the serpent represent Jesus? The serpent, as it was a reptile, a snake, it represented sin already judged. For Satan had sinned in the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which was not a reptile. He was the missing link between man and animal. And he stood there as they all, all walked upright and was the most subtle of all the beasts, not reptiles, of the beasts of the field. And when he was cursed, his legs went off of him and on his belly he went. And that showed that he was already judged when he became a reptile. And then Christ was sin in the serpent already judged the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see it? Now, he picked up the stick, and the supernatural on the stick was a serpent. Supernatural, it was a serpent in his hand. Natural, it was a stick in his hand. The cross plus Christ. The judgment. Here he goes down to Egypt. As I many times said, a one-man invasion. Had his wife, runs out his wife, and set her on the mule and a child on each hip, and here he is going towards Egypt, going down to take over. Could you imagine a one-man invasion going to Egypt to take over? But he did it, because God promised him he'd do it. And while he was down there, when Moses went in, he waved this stick across the rivers, and they turned into blood. Then he waved them towards the skies, and the sun went dark. And he, everywhere he put that stick before him, it was judgment. Judgment went before the stick because the stick was the judgment rod. You get it? Now, when he wanted to please, he raised this, this uh, stick towards the air like that and sprinkled some dirt, and as the dust flowed on, fleas come from everywhere. Judgment. Divine judgment. He brought fire out of heaven, lightning up on the earth, big hailstones and everything that killed the cattle and killed the Egyptians and everything else. Judgment. God's judgment before Moses. Now, as Moses went with the judgment stick before him, that same stick tonight to the church is Jesus Christ. If those Egyptians could have ever got that little simple stick out of Moses' hand, they'd have had him whipped. And when the 
when the devil could ever get the deity out of the name of Jesus Christ, he's got the church with. But as the judgment stick went before Moses to take the judgment, to bring the judgment, so does the name of Jesus go before us to take our judgment. Stands our judgment of sickness. Stands our judgment of death. Stands our judgment of trouble. Take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every care. When temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. When sickness begins to gather, breathe that name of Jesus. What is it? It's God's representative of judgment. Christ already judged for your sins. Christ already judged for your temptations. Christ already judged for your sickness. See what I mean? It was God's judgment rod. And as long as that rod waved on, it was judgment. Moses that night, after leading the children of Israel out, and there come Pharaoh's army, the pillar of fire went down and hung between Pharaoh and pursuing army and Israel. It made light to Israel and darkness to Pharaoh and kept them apart. Amen. A go-between. Oh, I'm so glad today that he is our go-between. And sickness in between death and life, he's my go-between. He's the one that takes death in one hand and life in the other. He's that link that connects man to God. The go-between. And he come down as a go-between. And he made light on this side for Israel to march on and darkness to hold Pharaoh back. That same angel of God is in the church tonight. Giving light for the church to walk on and darkness for those who reject. We are children of the light. Amen. How can you see when you walk in darkness? You can't see. You don't know where you're going. But if you're in the light, and Christ is the light, and he's giving light to those believers while he was giving darkness to the unbelievers, he was showing a way of the path to the believer and a darkness and stumbling about to the unbeliever. And so is it tonight as we're marching towards the promised land. God's throwing light on the path of divine healing, speaking with tongues, shoutings in the glories of God, manifesting them to the children of the light, and so in darkness back there that they stumble, not knowing where they're going. Remember that same stick, that hand that helped that judgment? Rob, when he come down and there was God's path running through the, the Red Sea, he waved that over the Red Sea and... The Red Sea, seeing the judgment, got scared and moved back on either side and made a pillar. And the marchers of Israel walked right across home dry land in the bottom of the sea. And when the uncircumcised, trying to pretend they were something when they were nothing, started to do so, God discomforted them, took the chariot wheels off, and scared the horses down there in the bottom of the sea in a great bit of conglomeration. And on the other side, that same judgment there were sin was in the valley. Praise God. Yeah. You know what led them through? That same pillar of fire that had been shown when it come down to this valley. It moved out over the top of that water and made a way. Where these back there without the leading of the Holy Spirit could not walk where those circumcised were walking. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, that makes me feel religious. Yeah. Now, think of it. The fight is on. Someday we got to come down to two great big dark valleys or pillows called the valley. That's what a wall on each side. The valley of the shadows of death. David said, I'll fear no evil for thou art with me. And when they seen that glorious great light of the pillar of fire whirling over the top of this water, seen those great big scary hills up there, maybe 40 fathoms deep, Way down deep in that mucky looking stuff at the bottom, and the angel of the Lord leading the way. Israel knew if the angel was going on, it was making a way, and no fear was in the way. Amen. Then one of these days we've got to come down to the valley of the shadows of death, just like that one. We'll fear no evil as long as the morning star is moving on before you, lighting up a way and making it possible for you to walk. Just the other side's the promised land. 
Amen. I'm so happy for that. <laughs> Notice. Then, when they got over on the other side, these uncircumcised said, well, if they can do it, we can too, and got drowned in the sea. That's it. Yeah. Confused yeah. and drowned and sank out in the sea. On they went. When they began to need water one day, God told Moses, listen closely. Oh, I want you to get this part of it. Here's the golden card of it. The people were thirsting. They were wondering, where can we drink? Our little children are starving. When their little children were sick, God erected a brass serpent. Another symbol, another stick, like the one Moses had in his hand, only the symbol with a snake wrapped around it. What was it? The judgment. Yeah. Drawing dividends yeah. on your insurance policy. Amen. Yeah. Drawing dividends on Calvary. For Moses, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the bright serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Yeah. He was lifted up for a compound reason, because they were chatting and, and jostling one another and fighting one another and despising Moses. And they were sinning, and they were sick, and they was lifted up for two reasons. To forgive their backslidings and to heal their sickness. Yeah. And he was wounded for our transgressions, and with his stripes we were healed. Yeah. Right. Scripture, every jump of it, every word, God's eternal word which can never pass away. Yeah. Hey, Amen. I'm so happy for that foundation. That was laid by Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and we're built together as blocks in the temple of the living God. Yeah. Our confession and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the same life that was in them is moving right through the building. Notice Moses, now he said he went out and he prayed, he said, Lord, these people are thirsting now, and there's no water to give them, and they're crying to me for water. And Moses and Aaron went to the ta uh, tabernacle and fell before the Lord, and the Shekinah glory of God fell around them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Shekinah glory. The presence of God fell around them. Why, well, brother, that's no more than what you feel in a good old-fashioned Holy Spirit meeting when the Shekinah glory of God drops down among you. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing. Moses raising his hands before God, almost transformed before them. God said, Moses, I'll go before you and stand in the gap upon the rock. I like that. I'll go before you and will stand up on the rock to provide a way for you. And when you come, strike the rock, take the rod now, and gather the people, and go and strike this rock. And it will bring forth the waters out of the rock. Oh my. I will stand on the rock before you. Look, Moses had to wait. God went before Moses and stood on the rock. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to watch the spiritual meaning of this. When we see God's word just unfolding, it just just you just can bathe in it. I can't. And I know you can too. And there Moses taking the rods and the judgment stick, going forth to the rock, and there stood God on the rock, and he smote the rock, and when he did, the waters gushed forth. Yeah. Not a little bitty stream like you see the artist draw the picture. I could drink that thing dry if I was thirsty. But look, enough water come out of it to water two million people plus camels and animals that they had. Come forth with gushers. Hallelujah. Beautiful type of it when Jesus said in the wilderness that he was the rock that was in the wilderness. No one of the people screamed back there that day when he come into Jerusalem riding on this horse, little mule. And there was crying, those Nazarenes crying, Hosanna, Hosanna to him that cometh in the name of the Lord. Some of those self-styled, starchy priests said, make them hold their peace. Yeah. <laughs> Why, well, I said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will yeah. immediately cry out. <laughs> what is the rocks? The rocks have been washed by the same waters. Yeah. Watered by the word. 
They have to cry out. Instead of they hold their feet, the rocks will immediately cry out. Something had to take place. The rock. Notice, later on, when they needed some water, the only thing they had to do was speak to the rock. One day they were hungry, and they went hunting, and they found in this cleft in the rock was honey hanging in the cleft. The cleft is in symbol was the spear mark in the side of the Lord Jesus. The cleft in the rock where it was smitten. And in there a bunch of bees that come and build a hive. And there was honey in the rock. Amen. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. Samson, when he was going down to see his wife, his girlfriend, and a lion run out, a little old fellow about that big seven little curls hanging down, little old sissy like. And people couldn't understand how that fellow could be so strong. And a great big old lion run out and said, Well, well, look here what's coming, Samson, this little old sissy standing there, and the lion run out many times his size. And then what taking place? Samson never walked up first and said, Here, I'll tear you apart. But the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. That's what did it. He felt back there and felt these seven locks hanging out. That was the covenant. And he wasn't scared of the lion in the face of death. He wasn't scared of it. If you can feel back, if Samson could feel seven locks and know it was the covenant because he was born to Nazarite, how much more ought a man that's born of the Holy Spirit feel the power of God and know it's the covenant? The same enemy before you. Whether it's sickness, whether it's temptation, whatever it is, you can't stand it when the Spirit of God comes. Walked over and grabbed that line, that little bitty curly-headed shrimp, grabbed that line to the jaw and tore it apart. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> you only need one, that's Christ! Amen. The covenant, can you feel it? Amen. <laughs> oh my, the covenant! Then when he threw that old line, it's like it was a little bitty old rabbit or something. Pulled him apart like this and whipped his old carcass over. Went walking on down through there. A few days he came by and a beehive was built in it. And he ate the sweetest honey he ever eat out of that old beehive. That was built in the carcass of the lion that was going to kill him. Yeah. For the Spirit of God come and delivered him. And if you've got something wrong tonight... Feel the Spirit of God moving on you. Tear the thing apart. Amen. And the first thing you know, you'll have a testimony that'll shake the shingles off the house. Amen. Amen. You're the covenant, circumcised by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Eat some sweet honey. Yeah. Really good when he says, say, Yes, brother, I believe in healing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amen. When I used to be led around with the arm, great big glasses on, like that, and could hardly see where I was going. And now I got a testimony because I realized my position in Christ Jesus. He made a covenant, and I received it and believed him. And today it's sweet honey to eat it. Tell others. Now, notice again quickly, we'll get down there. Then when the rock was smitten, very beautiful type, then people were perishing and dying. And it was a type of God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. In the midst of a perishing, dying people, a perishing, dying nation, God so loved the unworthy, Look how unworthy they were. And God so loved, oh, if it wasn't for the love of God, he'd destroy the whole world tonight. But he can't do it. His love won't let him do it. So he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but could drink the waters of life freely, whosoever will may come. Just an ab a bountiful blessing pouring out. He that believeth on me, in other words, take it like this. He that believeth on me shall have a great big gusher right in the middle of his soul, bubbling up into everlasting life. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Yeah. Notice that God took all the judgments of death 
the death that I should die, the hell that I should go to. God, with his judgments of death and sickness, Christ met him in the gap, hanging between the heavens and earth, and God struck upon him the iniquity of us all. There, the judgment was smitten, and tonight that insign of the cross, a blindfold to the world, but to those who march on with a cross going on before them, the judgment is paid. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. For it's recorded in his words, hallelujah, it's only that we look and live. Yes. If you're sick, look and live. Yes. If you're downhearted, look and live. Yes. If you're weary, look and live. Yes. If you're dead in sin and trespasses, look and live. Yes. That's all. For the cross goes on before us. God's putting before us this inside of the cross. Realizing it through that comes just like the serpent. It wasn't the stick. It was the serpent that represented on there that made the atonement. And it wasn't the, it ain't the wooden cross that we packed. It's the Holy Spirit that's wrapped into that, that great sign out of inside on Calvary. When the life of the Holy Spirit was in Christ come out of him, yeah. it went to whosoever it might come from this cross. And the cross is God's sign before us tonight to follow Jesus. My, I think of God standing there on the rock. God was that rock. And Moses' judgment rod, judgment, God judgment, smote Christ, dying in our stead, the innocent for the guilty, and out of him come the blood cell, and the life-giving blood flowed from his back that we might be healed, flowed from his heart that we might be saved, come down over his brows and things for our iniquity. For our peace and all was upon him. There he was a bleeding malefactor hanging there between heavens and earth, standing where a holy God looking down could not see the sinner no more. For he looked through that judgment had been paid down to the all supreme prize. Oh, I hope you see it, my Christian friend. And look out of there, there it is. As far as God is concerned, it's finished. Amen. The price is paid. You're free. Oh, that's, right. that's what's the trouble people tonight they don't know they're free here not long ago an old farmer had a had a corn field the crows kept coming by eating up his corn so he set a trap and caught one he said I'll fix the rest of them he tied up that foot into the fence and that poor old crow hobbled and jumped and hobbled and jumped and he couldn't get away because he was tied up he was starving he'd eat everything around where he could reach he was starving to death he got so he just couldn't hardly fly or jump up and down anymore all the other crows would come by and holler, come on, Johnny Crow, let's go south, it's turning winter, you'll die sitting there, let's go, Johnny Crow, he said, I can't, I'm tired. One day a good man come by, so that poor old crow, look at him hobbling around there, he's getting weak, so he caught the old fellow, patted him a little bit, took the lash off of his foot like that and turned him loose, said, all right, old boy, go on. Walked away and the old crow just kept walking around the same circle, same circle. See, he was untied and didn't know it. The other crows come by and say, Come on, Johnny Crow, let's go south. It's coming winter. Said, I can't. I'm still tied. That's the way it is with men and women tonight who don't know their position in Christ Jesus. Amen. The devil may have you tied with TB. He may have you tied with a cancer. Yeah. He may have you tied to many things. But Christ, the good man, Amen. has stood your judgment down and set you free life. God bless your heart. You can rise in the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's not go south, but let's go towards glory. Yeah. Marching as the great army of the living God. We are free. Can't you hear the others say, come on. I once was bound by a chain of sin, but tonight I've been cut loose by Jesus Christ. Hey, Amen. The judgment. Sure, Christ took our judgment. The innocent for the guilty. He was made sin that we might not be sinners. He was made it for our sickness that we wouldn't have to bear it. He bore our sorrows that we wouldn't have to sorrow no more, as others which have no hope, says the Scripture. He was all that we need was right in Him. You believe that? Amen. Certainly. You believe that for your heart trouble, lady sitting there? You believe it for that heart condition? Do you really accept it now with all your heart? Then He bore your heart trouble and you ain't got it no more now. Amen. Amen. If you believe it, 
You can have it. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the chastened of our peace up on him, and with his stripes we were healed. Yeah. After that rock was once smitten, God told Moses, said, Go on, Moses. The only thing you have to do now is go speak to that rock from this own. Every time you need water, speak to it. You don't have to smite it anymore. You don't have to pound all night long. You don't have to worry and beg and pray and fast and go on. Just speak to the rock. Hallelujah. And it will bring forth his waters. Amen. Speak to the rock and it will bring forth his waters. I tell you one time there's a woman with a blood issue. And all that she had was lost. She could not be healed by any doctor. And she come down along the bank one day and she seen that spiritual rock rolling by and she spake to the rock. Just as this woman did here just a few minutes ago. Spoke to the rock and out of the rock come healing waters. Hallelujah. There was a little man named Jairus who really loved the Lord, but he was a secret worshiper. And one day his little girl died. All hopes is gone. But he spake to the rock. And the rock gave not only water, but life. The waters of life freely. Another woman by the name of Martha and Mary, they loved him and he'd gone from their home. And their brother was dead and rotten out there in the grave. One day they heard that the rock was come rolling into the city. And Martha had been very dilatory about cooking good dinners for him and things and not maybe paying to the, so much attention to the spiritual, but in her heart she believed it, for she showed them what she was. She ran out and knelt down on her knees and she spake to the rock. And the rock in return spoke in eternity and raised a dead man out of his grave. Hallelujah! When a bunch of people was out on a little boat one night and it stoppered around like a bottle stopper jumping from place to place. All hope so that ever be saved was gone. And they had to realize that laying in the bow of the boat was a rock. They spake to the rock about their troubles. And it soothed down. And the winds folded their arms and went to the crevices. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the sea that was rocking smoothed out like a mother singing a lullaby to her baby. She, they spake to the rock. And the rock brought forth the the substance that they asked for. Are you speaking terms with him tonight? Could you speak to him about your chest, chest trouble sitting there? You believe that God has healed you? You just got through speaking to him, didn't you? Didn't you say, Lord, heal me? You spoke to him and your chest trouble's gone now. Speak to the rock. He'll bring forth his waters. Hallelujah. Moses, when his time had come and everything had failed, God said, come up, and he climbed up to the top of Mount Nebo to look over into the promised land. There had death come whirling through the air. He knew that death was all around him. And Moses looked around, and he looked laying there by his side, and there lay the rock. He stepped up on the rock, he followed it all the way through the wilderness, or he followed him. He stepped up on the rock, and God sent some pall barriers, angels down, and he packed him away off the rock. Hallelujah! That rock had fed him when he was hungry, gave him water when he was thirsty, and taken him to home in glory when he was dying. My prayer is tonight, Lord Jesus, pull me up above this worldly element here so I can be on speaking terms with you. That someday when I go down through the valley of the shadow of death, I expect to see the rock standing there. Hallelujah. Keep me on speaking terms with him. I myself want to speak to him. You need to speak to him. He's here tonight. And he's on speaking terms with every one of you. If you want to speak to him, do you believe it? For whatever need you have, need of, let us stand to our feet at this time now. Oh, my. Oh, I feel like if you put this church on my shoulder, I can walk away with it. What? The rock Christ Jesus is here. Oh, I'm not excited. I know exactly where I'm standing. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, if I could only express my feelings. If I could only tell this audience what it really means to be sitting under the anointing of this rock Christ Jesus. Already paid your judgment, bore your sickness, took your sorrow, 
and settle a question before God. Are you scared to put your trust in Him? You don't have to be judged. You don't have to think yourself worthy. You'll never be worthy. But Christ was worthy in your stead that paid the price. That's trying to redeem something you can't uh, redeem it. Of course, you ain't got the money to. But God had the money and He sent Christ and settled the bill and redeemed you from your sickness and your sorrows and your weary and your sin uh, and your backsliding. He sent the money, which was Christ Jesus, and deposited it on Calvary on Golgotha's hill. And tonight, every one of you is free if you'll just believe it. Uh, oh, Christ of God. I speak to you as Moses of old in behalf of this perishing people with sickness and with trouble. Oh, everlasting God, from the everlasting hills, lift up thine head, Lord, and receive this people into thy kingdom. And receive, Lord, may the Holy Ghost so anoint these people tonight that they'll feel their covenant like Samson did when he felt the covenant hair. May the Holy Ghost wrap around every heart tonight so people will realize that it's the covenant that you made with them and they can go and be free. I condemn every sickness, every disease, every sin. I say as your servant, Lord, in the word of humility to you, but in a bitter rebuke before the devil, Satan, you've lost the battle. You might as well give it up. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of every person in here that they can be made free. Amen.